Okay, thank you, Beck, and thanks everyone for coming along this morning and uh, the chance to share some thoughts with you around uh, openness and AI. Obviously, there's lots of interest in AI these days, um, especially since uh, last year they released uh, ChatGPT and and um, some of the you know uh, interfaces into Midjourney and these kind of things. So the, the generative AI stuff is very kind of um, prevalent at the moment. Um, uh, but the thing that I'm kind of interested in around the use of AI in education is specifically around um, the idea of openness and, you know, what does it mean for open education? What are the implications? How can we articulate um, um, an authentically open um, version of what happens with the use of AI in education? Uh, so that's the angle that I've been sort of coming at it from. Um, in fact, the sort of thread that I've been working on with this stuff originally was around some CalRG and OpenTEL presentations. So that's where I started doing this, this kind of work. Um, but I'll take you through kind of where I've got to with it and how it's uh, progressing, the kind of directions that um, I think it can be taken in. Um, and then hopefully we'll have some chance at the end for some discussions. So um, just briefly, um, I'm going to introduce my, myself um, and then I'm going to talk about this concept of opera. Um, which is open educational practices for AI and education. Um, and that will lead me through to a discussion around, um, I guess, what the, why there's a need for it, why there's a need for an open version of all this stuff, and how openness as a concept is sometimes misused in the discourse around um, AI and education. Um, and then I'm going to talk a bit about the idea of explicable AI as a kind of vector for openness. Does it make sense as a way to conceptualize openness in AIED? Um, and then I'm going to talk a bit more about specifically the uh, copyright implications, the relationship to the commons, what does it mean for uh, intellectual property rights and that kind of thing? Is it an opportunity or a threat for open educational resources? Um, and then at the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about the idea of a digital, digital divide resulting from AI rather than being solved by AI. Um, so a bit of background on me. Um, I think a lot of people who come to CalRG will, will know me already. Uh, I'm a senior research fellow in IET. Um, I've been working in IT for about 15 years um, and I started just before the end of my PhD in philosophy. Um, mostly I'm working on open education research, uh, but I do do some other stuff. Uh, you can see the some of the projects that I've worked on uh, on the right hand side of the page, uh, mostly either European funded projects or funded by the Hewlett Foundation, who are our main funder. Um, a lot of the um, work I do is a kind of critical take on openness, but I also advocate for openness and producing open learning materials, open educa educational practices and that kind of thing. Um, I also do a significant amount of mentoring work. Um, most recently, I became um, an expert reviewer for the Turing Institute, um, and I've been reviewing some of their uh, recent um, enrichment funding applications from current PhD students working on AI. So um, just to elaborate this opera concept a little bit, um, and in some ways it was an, it's an attempt to sort of like get a little bit ahead of the curve on some of this stuff because you know the AI stuff is happening, um, but there isn't really a kind of, you know, an articulation with clear, um, and rigorous kind of lines around what does it mean to be an open practitioner in an AI space. There was a recent um, um, meta review of research in AIED, um, which is Melissa Bond and colleagues, and they found that there's this ongoing need for more ethical perspectives, more collaboration, more interdisciplinarity, um, greater rigor, all of these things around AIED. And I think those things are true. And um, you know, there is a lot of um, sort of low quality research around AI, which you've probably seen, and a lot of it seems to be written by GPTs these days. And, you know, every every day on, on um, social media, I see a different kind of take where someone's printed a journal article and it's still got the, you know, well, as, as a GPT, I can only do so much kind of intro at the start of it. And no one's taken it out. The, whatever process of peer review that journal's got, whatever ethics the writer's got, you know, obviously, like people are using these technologies, um, and th there is definitely a need for uh, more guidance around that. 
Um, but I would say, you know, so you could say, what does it mean for it to be open in the first place? What are you talking about? Um, and that'd be a fair question, I think, in a way, that's the thing that I'm trying to focus on. Um, but you could talk about open educational practices in terms of values, in terms of um, collaboration structures, power structures, um, in terms of making things more inclusive, more diverse, more equitable, having greater transparency around workflows and outputs, putting open licenses on things, publishing open access journals. Um, but with AI, you might also get into the realms of kind of open algorithms or um, training sets for GPTs and these kind of things. Um, you could even have, you know, thinking ahead to um, virtual reality, augmented reality, extended reality, these kind of things. All of the infrastructure around that, all of the software that supports that, templates for uh, learning scenarios that use those things, they can all be openly licensed, they can all be openly created and shared. Because we know that when we get new technologies, often what happens is there's um, you know, instantly a divide between who can use these things and who can't. Um, so yeah, so there's lots of different stuff here. Um, and I'd also say that um, it's important to kind of have a socio-technical perspective on what it means. Um, and I'm gonna try and kind of start off by just explaining what I mean by that. Um, if you think about the technology stacks that support the use of um, things like ChatGPT or um, the plugins that are increasingly appearing in Microsoft products and that kind of thing, the end user only really sort of sees the final point of contact, you know, the interface. And um, obviously behind that, there's vast technology stacks, um, all of which obviously has a kind of requirement in terms of computing potential, power, um, people who work around it to support it and that kind of thing. And it often goes back a bit further than we appreciate. And um, back in 2021, there was this influential uh, book called Anatomy of AI. And um, like the, the slide can't really show all of it, right? Because it's too big. So this is why I suggest maybe it's worth looking at the link. This is the um, socio-technical structure that supports the Amazon Echo speaker. And in a way, you've got all those kind of technical systems that I referred to on the previous slide. Um, but you've also got things in here like where do the where do the minerals and metals come from to you know build the speakers and that can be a very long tail a very long kind of chain of, of events behind it um, with a significant environmental impact um, also a lot of these um, systems are very energy intensive intensive and they require a lot of power which again has an, an environmental impact which can be absolutely huge um, the open AI CEO was talking about, you know, some de developing some system where the energy requirements would be equal to Canada or something, you know, something crazy like that. Um, so that's all happening, right? And so that's one part of it. But then you've also got just the people involved in this. So who's training these systems? Sometimes, you know, people are moderating very objectionable content in a developing country for, you know, next to nothing in terms of reimbursement. And they're totally being taken advantage of. And again, this is not very obvious to the end user of a system, right? So you've got these big um, socio-technical structures that exist in support of um, AI systems. And so one, one sort of thought I'd like to put out there to start with is that an open perspective on this stuff will incorporate the full socio-technical picture. It won't obscure any of that, if you like. So it's a transparency to these systems, how they really work and who it really affects. Um, both when they're going, when they're working as they should, and when they're not. So the system as a whole, I think, is is part of it. Um, one thing that you notice in the kind of AI space, and this is not unique to AI, this is a lot of other places, like a lot of journals do this as well, is kind of branding yourself as open, because it's a kind of positive connotation a lot of the time. And if you're familiar with the OER space, Open Educational Resources, this, there's a long-standing sort of issue around this where journals that are not really open access call themselves open something or other, or that someone will talk about their open scholarship thing, technology, and it's just an open API or something behind it, right? It's nothing really there, but they call themselves open and they brand themselves that way because people like things that are open. Um, but you, you can sort of take this to a different um, place with AI because um, what's happening with 
AI algorithms is itself a kind of opaque thing a lot of the time. Even for the people who design and use these algorithms, this is what sometimes it's called the, the black box, right? You know what the inputs are that you send in, you know what the outputs are that come out the other side, but you don't necessarily know what's happening in the middle, right? In the actual, you know, um, application of the algorithm. Sometimes it's because the algorithms are self updating or they refine, you know, as they're going along and they doesn't really, it's not really transparent to anyone. Um, sometimes it's because these are essentially trade secrets, right? It's the, it's the secret source that's um, allowing it to work. So people can argue there's a business interest. We don't have to tell anyone what's really going on inside our algorithm or whatever. Um, so so there's, a, there's a sort of tension in the discourse around AI, around what is open and what is not. Um, I think I'd like to put forward the idea that typically machine learning alg algorithms are closed. And most of the time uh, in AIED, when people talk about openness, it's not really what we think of in open education as openness. Um, so there is the possibility of this um, uh, kind of authentic opera, if you like, where we have open algorithms working off open data sets, um, and we're using different AI enhanced tools for things like finding, designing, repurposing, and using uh, educational resources. Um, but I don't think we've, we're there yet. Um, but I think that's up for, you know, contention. Um, but I think the idea of open and closed algorithms is another aspect to this. Because um, it's not it's not the, the system itself that's open or closed necessarily. You can just have the the algorithms being open or closed, uh, the data sets and so on. Uh, why is it important? You could easily talk for an hour and more on this. Um, I'm not going to spend very long on it today. But we know that um, a lot of algorithms are biased, and they're biased in ways which are uh, unhelpful to marginalised people, and that often reflects the data sets that they're trained on. Um, and I'll say a bit more about that in a second. Um, but there are many critiques of this, and they're all worth having a look at. Um, but one idea here is the idea that if we want to have justice as a sort of function of AIED, then transparency in, in our algorithms is a pretty essential part of that, because otherwise we don't really know what's happening with these algorithms and who they're affecting and how. So again, there's a socio-technical aspect to that as well. So where some of these things come together is in this idea of explicable AI in education. And originally, um, when I started working on this stuff, I was trying to articulate this kind of authentically open uh, version of AI in education. And I ended up getting sort of, not sidetracked, but I realized there was a bit more sort of foundational stuff to do. So I ended up looking a lot at this idea of explicable AI in education um, as a way to kind of bring some of these concepts together. And so the basic idea here is that explicability um, in the use of AI. So sometimes people say explicable AI, sometimes they say explainable AI, um, and they, they often use interchang interchangeably. I'd probably want to say um, explicable should refer to something like it's possible to explain it, right? Um, and explainable would refer to something more like a specific context where you know, can you explain it to this person or to this group? Um, and that might seem like a sort of um, slightly pedantic distinction, but um, hopefully it'll make sense in a second. Um, but this is often the sort of stock response when people say, these, these algorithms, you know, we don't know what's happening. It's, it's, it's not just, it's having bad effects on different groups and so on. And so the often, uh, the answer that people put forward is like, we all just need to make it all explicable, make it all explainable, make it transparent, and then no one can have any issues with you know, the, the algorithms because we all know what's happening. I think where I've got to with this is like we should be a little bit suspicious of people who are saying that what they're doing is fully explicable when it comes to AI. Um, and again, it's like almost like another form of branding. So oh yeah, it's, it's explicable, so don't worry about it. Um, one um, idea here as well is, is the idea that, you know, explicable or explainable, it's not a binary, right? There's not just like some things are, are not understood and explainable and other things are, um, because it depends on which stakeholders you're talking about, who's involved in this. And just to use an example from um, educational technology, you could say, well, look, um, you know, we could, we could have a really faithful, really true description 
of what an algorithm might be doing. But if we show it to a student, they might have no idea what it's supposed to mean. You know, they don't have the concepts necessarily to really explain an algorithm and how it's affecting them. Um, and so it's not enough to put it in front of people and say, there you go, you've, you've seen the explicable version. Um, and I think that has implications for pedagogy as well. Um, so, so one idea here is if you say, okay, we separate out these ideas of what explicable means. Um, and um, in this typology, you've got the, the distinction between humanly understandable things, which you call interpretability um, as a feature of XAI and fidelity, which is the true, as true as possible description. And already the as true as possible description is sort of highly technical. And it's only gonna be understood by a certain number of people who have the, the skills and background knowledge to understand that. Um, so you, so in it, as soon as we try to make things interpretable, we kind of put them in a different language. You know, we try to make them a bit more understandable, you know, in that sense. Um, I'm not saying that's bad, but what I do think is we should be wary about kind of a universal description of these things, because depending on what kind of stakeholder you are in the system, a different kind of explanation may, may, may make more sense to you. So you could frame this as saying, well, actually, what we need to be is sort of less essentialist about XAI. The explainability is not a feature of the AI system. It's a feature of one person trying to explain the system to another person and sort of see it more in that way, which I guess you could also call them sort of socio-technical shift rather than just the system in itself. Um, but yeah, what value does it have to a stakeholder to give them a really, you know, faithful, true description of what's happening in a, in a machine learning algorithm? I'm not sure it has a lot of value to most people. Um, but you could say there is room here for some sort of new role in educational institutions where there's something like a broker whose job is to kind of explain to different stakeholder types what's actually happening and they can speak the different languages as it were that they need to for that. Um, coming at the explicability thing from another angle, so this is coming at it from the angle of ethics instead, um, there's an interesting paper, there's an AI for people project um, and it was led by, I think, Luciano Floridi, who's one of the sort of leading ethicists of AI. And um, to cut a long story short, they go through a whole bunch of different um, ethical frameworks that have been proposed for um, AI. Um, and they say, look, actually, um, we can boil these all down to four traditional ethical principles, namely benefic beneficence, so the idea of doing good, non-maleficence, avoiding harm, autonomy, um, so preserving people's ability, abilities for self-determination and, and so on, and justice. Uh, and then they want to add this new thing and say, actually, the distinctive ethical requirement with regards to AI is explicability. So it's the ability to, you know, dissect what's happening inside these AI systems and reconstruct it. Um, and they go on to say, actually, what you also need is to have a human, human being that's taking responsibility for any, any decisions that are made which seems to me to be a good idea. Um, and so, so there's an eth ethical sort of line into this stuff. And then there's the sort of more um, technical line that I've just spoken about. Um, but I think there are good arguments for saying something like, you know, XAI should be the, the default expectation for AI in education, unless there's something else that, you know, should override it or that kind of thing. Um, so there's, so there's, you know, different different routes into this idea of transparency and uh, as a kind of proxy or a vector for openness in education um, and the greater internal visibility of systems and the more um, uh, the more the people involved with it have the, the concepts and the language to articulate, you know, what's actually going on. Um, I do have a paper on this published last year if you wanted to check it out and the link will be in the slides. Um, so now I just want to move on to talk a bit more about um, the impact on, uh, I guess, open educational resources, more or less. Um, so what's actually happening at the moment, um, a lot of the time, is that companies are just training their algorithms on whatever they can get their hands on, um, mostly copyrighted content, as far as um, most people can tell. Um, they don't really have to tell you, right, at the moment, what they're doing. Um, so this leads you to some interesting places. 
so for instance, um, there was a court case um, last year in the United States, and the outcome of this was the ruling that whatever's coming out of ChatGPT or some other GPT, it's not got an author in the in the classic sense. And so it's not a work in the classic sense. It can't be copyrighted on that basis because copyright is a sort of uh, moral right you know, given to an author. So this is an interesting pos pop, uh, proposition because you could say, well, look, um, that means whatever comes out of a GPT is by default considered to be public domain. That means you can do whatever you like with it, right? Um, and some people have said, okay, well, we can use it to create OERs then, right? And def definite yes, right? But with an asterisk, it says, hmm, case law is still unfolding here. And I would be very surprised if things stay as they are, because um, at the moment, Copyright holders are not very happy about this situation. Um, also, and, and they probably got a good case, right? And I'll say about that more about that in a second. But also, um, the you know, you can't openly license the things that are coming out of a GPT if it's you know public domain. It doesn't really matter so much. Um, but you could say, well, what if we were to just train our GPT on openly licensed materials? That doesn't really make much difference um, because as long as you have the attribution clause in your in your open materials, then you'd be required to say, I got this bit from here in some way. But the output of a GPT at the moment doesn't really accommodate that. So even if you were to train your GPT on purely openly licensed materials, you wouldn't be able to give the right attribution um, to make it legit. Right, so so it can't reconstruct all the different, you know, part, you can't put the pieces back together necessarily in the way that you'd have to. Um, so you could say, well, actually, then it doesn't matter so much. It would just all, all just be um, public domain, and you know, you can do whatever you like with it, maybe. But um, you know, to take an example, so this is currently going through. This is New York Times versus OpenAI and Microsoft, and um, it's currently in court. And um, what you can see here is for, on the right hand side the original text looking at the red text on the right hand side that's the text from the new york times and on the left hand side that's the output from gpt4 and you can see there's just one word of difference right it's it's debuted in the original and premiered in gpt4 um, and as you can see from the very top they've given a hundred examples like this to the court in this case right um, so if you're looking at this from a copyright point of view, and you say, okay, there's the original, there's the, you know, the, the new machine learning produced version, you would have to say that is a copyright violation, clearly, right? If, if, if you or I were to try and like write something that close to something that's copyrighted, it'd be obviously a violation. So I'd be very surprised if this court case doesn't result in some sort of you know, difference to the current status quo. Um, and if you think about the likes of Disney being involved, you could train um, train a, a GPT to, or, you know, on all the Disney films. I say, okay, we're going to start making Disney films. Can't see Disney being okay with that. So um, there will be some other cases that really, you know, test this even more, um, especially once we're getting away from purely just text-based stuff. Um, so it will be a, it's an ongoing thing, but I don't think we can rely on the idea that things that come out of GPTs will always be public domain. Um, especially when we can show this clearly that they've been trained on copyrighted materials. Plus, it doesn't solve it that much if we just use um, open uh, content. Um, another thing here you might find interesting is that a lot of people are changing the terms and conditions to allow them to use your data to train um, machine learning algorithms. So Dropbox slipped this into their terms and conditions relatively recently. And say, oh yeah, by the way, um, yeah, we're just going to share your stuff with OpenAI and maybe let them do a bit of training on your stuff. Um, is this transparent? I guess it's legal, right? They change the terms and conditions, but do people know? Do they appreciate that? Probably not. Um, if you want to find, uh, if you want an amusing, stroke, terrifying clip, um, I couldn't embed it here because it's just a thing on Twitter. Um, but there's an interview with the the chief technical officer from OpenAI. And um, 
they, they were asked about, you know, where do you get your data from? And, you know, they basically just refuse to, they either don't know or they won't say, they're just using whatever they can get their hands on. Um, and it's quite telling the way that they kind of, don't even seem to really think of it as an issue, right? Don't, they're not focused on that at all. They're just focused on how do we train this thing to make it as, as good as possible to do certain tasks and so on. Um, so whereas you might have seen in some of this stuff a big opportunity for the commons and you know the idea of um, using GBTs to create all kinds of resources, I'm not sure that's the way it's going to go. I wonder if um, we might end up with a situation where OERs are not so much like not a thing anymore, um, but we won't really need the workflow of OER because maybe you'll just have some big repositories that are essentially like machine learning databases and you will just call down the thing that you need and it will just create it in real time for you. Um, and so there's less need then to sort of openly license things and share them back and, you know, you wouldn't have repositories of OER so much, you'd have repositories of, you know, data that can be, can be used to legitimately create resources on the fly. That remains to be seen, but it's kind of an interesting scenario. Um, so just thinking about kind of how, how some of this plays out legally. Um, so you, you may have been following the EU AI Act, um, which does emphasize some of these things around in transparency and, and open source um, approaches. They've got special provision for open source um, models in there, which is interesting and, and I think a positive step. Um, some people have criticized the idea of open source training models on the basis that they don't have the safety protocols built into them that some of the commercial ones do. So you could say, well, you know, you know, it might tell you how to build a nuclear bomb or something by accident or something like that. Um, not very persuasive, um, I don't think. Um, and um, it remains to be seen. I know there's some horizon calls at the moment which are focused on this idea of open source model production. And it'd be interesting to see kind of where that ends up. Um, in, but it's, it's encouraging, I think, to see that there's support for it at that level. Um, so just thinking about this idea of, you know, openness once more, but this time in terms of like inclusion, I guess. Um, how's it all going to affect higher education? It's unfolding. I don't have all the answers, right, obviously. But when we look at what has happened with other technologies, take, for example, MOOCs. So 10 years ago, that, that was, you know, the big thing. And people spoke a lot about how it was going to equalize educational opportunity and, and so on. Um, but what happened in reality? Well, mostly people taking MOOCs are people who, you know, often already have a degree, they have access to the internet, you know, they have um, some opportunities and some basic skills that allow them to take advantage of the offer of MOOCs. Um, I think there's probably a similar thing happening with AI. Um, I think on the one hand, um, you know, these kind of technologies can be quite impressive, but they can also be like shockingly bad as well, depending on kind of luck of, luck of the draw in a way when you're using them and um, the kind of task that you're asking uh, something to do. But if you look at the massive costs associated with producing AI systems and running them, um, we're at a point in the cycle where yeah, they're free, you know, free to use and experiment with and everyone, hey everyone, have you ever heard of this chat GPT thing? Check it out. Um, but as we know from other platforms, um, and even if you think about, you know, Netflix or something, and the price keeps getting higher, and you know, arguably the service gets worse, now there's adverts introduced, you know, and this 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 sort of process of where more and more value has to be extracted from the platform to recover the initial costs of the um, investment and the venture capitalists and you know, shareholders eventually will need their payments all the time. Um, there's a word for this, right? And it's enshittification, which was the word of the year for the American Dialectical Society last year. And it comes from this book by uh, Cory Doctorow. And um, it's this idea that things get worse over time. Um, and it's kind of a capitalist thing. It's kind of about the need for profits. Um, but I think the AI space is rife with it because at the moment we've got massive, massive, massive amounts of money being thrown at it. Microsoft just threw 10 billion into OpenAI. Um, but all that has to be kind of clawed back at some point. 
So I don't think that we're necessarily in a place where um, AI is going to solve educational access. But I do think that for a lot of people, what you what they'll be able to get through their phone, um, you know, especially five, 10 years from now, that may well meet whatever needs they have at the time in terms of you know, needing to learn something quickly or find out the answer to a question as interfaces get more and more kind of um, natural to use. Um, I think, you know, there's a kind of a risk there for higher education. Um, and it remains to be seen in sort of how best to use these kind of tools to promote access to higher education and a kind of, you know, the full higher education experience um, rather than just, you know, whatever you need to learn at the time, you can just kind of access it on your phone and ChatGPT will tell you what you need to do. So, um, so an opportunity and a threat, maybe you could say. I just want to say something very quickly about some of the um, work around this and sort of, um, so, so what I've presented to you are basically five of what I initially created. There are 10 propositions about um, open education and AI. And I kind of used that as a starting point. And since January, between January and now, I've been working with some members of the Gojian Research Group, it's the Global OER Graduate Network, uh, which myself and, and, and Becca are, are part of the coordination team for. And we've been doing a kind of sprint around um, discussing some of the issues around open education and AI and um, trying to make sense of different areas and uh, thinking about what's coming up and all these kind of things. And so there's a team of people um, in various institutions around the world. I won't say all their names, um, but I'd like to acknowledge them for their input into some of these processes. Um, what we've been doing with it most recently is um, a mind map. And I think, Beck, if you could put in the chat, please, the uh, links here, people can have a quick look themselves. And the actual kind of bit around the propositions is quite small. It's quite now quite sprawling and there's quite a lot of different stuff going on. There's some stuff around teaching and learning, some stuff around research, stuff around sort of some of the concepts around AI and education, um, some of the risks, some of the regulations. And, you know, there's a kind of artifact there which might be worth engaging with. Um, we can have a look at it in a second if you want to, or you, if you want to ask me about it. But for now, I'll just say thanks so much for your attention and um, more than happy to have a discussion with you in the next few minutes. So thanks.